1916, while New Zealand focused on a great world war 12,000 miles away, another war ended in the heart of the North Island. Māori prophet Rua Kenana had built a thriving community at Maungopohatu in the rugged Uruweta. Maungopohatu was the last stronghold of Māori independence. Rua was not hostile to Pākehā or to change, but he would not accept Pākehā rule. In the midst of a world war, the government would not accept Rua's state within a state. On Sunday, 2nd of April 1916, armed police converged on Maungopohatu. A gunfight broke out and at least eight people were killed or wounded. Historians have described this as the last shooting of the New Zealand wars. The main body of the New Zealand wars took place between 1843 and 1872. My generation didn't learn much about them at school. What we did learn was a sanitised version, supporting New Zealand's reputation as a paradise of racial harmony. The wars, we were told, were nice, clean little fights with gloves on, after which Māori and Pākehā kissed, made up and lived happily ever after. Real wars, like real history, were supposed to happen overseas. Yet the New Zealand wars raged across the whole of the North Island for almost 30 years, with heroism and massacre on both sides. They wrenched New Zealand history into new shapes. They left deep wounds, concealed but not healed by the scabs of legend, and we're still paying for them in more ways than one. The wars helped make Māori and Pākehā, lumping Māori tribes into a people and splitting Pākehā settlers off from the old British. They were New Zealand's great civil war, the grand clash of its two peoples. My name's James Bellich, and this is their story. These are veterans of the New Zealand wars. There are few images of them at the time of conflict. They were old when the cameras caught up with them, young when they took up arms. Well into the 20th century, veterans still turned out to commemorate their deeds on New Zealand's battlefields. In 1908, one contingent of veterans marched through Wellington to celebrate Dominion Day. The same year, another turned out in Auckland to welcome the American Navy. They were joined by the Māori King Mahuta, a descendant of their arch-enemy. In 1911, more veterans paraded through New Plymouth's Pukakura Park. We need to see the real lives and real history behind these images. They are not mementos hanging on walls or hidden away in dusty photo albums, but real flesh and blood. The last vestiges of the men and women who fought the New Zealand wars. They made history. We forgot it. From the beginning of contact in 1642 until 1840, there were a dozen or so violent clashes between Māori and European, some quite major. Yet the really surprising thing is not the amount of violence, but the lack of it. In the decades before 1840, something like a thousand European and American ships visited New Zealand, each with an average crew of 30 men. About 200 whaling, trading, timber and mission stations dotted the coasts. In relation to thousands upon thousands of contact incidents, a dozen or so violent incidents was not a lot. The fact is that before 1840, Māori and European got on remarkably well. There were two reasons for this, sex and guns. The gun trade led to the terrible musket wars of the 1820s, when generals such as Hongihika of Napuhi rampaged through the land. Thousands were killed and thousands more enslaved. The musket wars moved from north to south in a domino effect. 
They ended in the 1830s, once all tribes had guns. Brown Bess muskets encouraged into tribal violence, but discouraged into racial violence. To survive, Māori had to have muskets, and to get muskets, they had to have Europeans. Eight large pigs and 150 baskets of potatoes were a typical price for a musket. The dried heads of enemies killed by one gun could be traded for another. But the proceeds from traded goods weren't nearly enough for the thousands of muskets Māori needed. The balance of payments deficit was made up by services, especially sex. Before 1840, the settlers living in New Zealand were mostly men. They were linked into tribal society by formal or informal marriages to Māori woman, a treaty made in bed. From 1800, whaling ships visited the coast, stopping a few weeks for supplies and recreation. The captains paid guns for the supplies, and the sailors paid guns for the recreation. A three-week sex contract with a Māori woman usually cost one musket and one dress. By the 1830s, the sex trade became New Zealand's biggest industry. Missionaries left few details. French visitors were less coy. We were given an exhibition of their love dances. Nothing could be more lewd or more obscene than their movements, gestures and poses. Their arms and breasts were tattooed with the names of their lovers, the name of the ship and the date of its visit. The New Zealanders are astonishingly salacious. The sex industry supplied Māori with guns in bulk at a price their menfolk at least could afford. Ironically, the gun trade helped keep the peace between the races. If Māori mistreated Europeans, the vital trade would stop. If Europeans mistreated Māori, they would be killed. Before the 1840s, few Europeans tried it. Māori needed Europeans and Europeans needed Māori. It's this that explains the surprisingly low rate of interracial violence before the 1840s. The main centre of early Māori-European relations was Kororaraka in the Bay of Islands. Now known as Russell, it was then known as the hellhole of the Pacific. Kororaraka is this country's oldest town, the birthplace of urban New Zealand. In the 1830s it had one or two hundred permanent inhabitants and a floating population of up to a thousand, mainly American whalers. It's ship girls swimming out to each new ship by the score and its wild orgies around bonfires on this beach were notorious. The town's only European law and order was provided by a vigilante group known as the Kororaraka Association. Its sole crime-busting achievement consisted in tiring and feathering a visitor from Sydney for the worst crime that the New Zealand frontier could conceive of, debt collecting. This was a time when New York was closed on Sundays. Kororaraka in 1844 was too much for the American consul, John B. Williams. Six-eighths of all the European houses are nothing more than groggeries. Every thinking man who has visited will coincide with me in my remarks that New Zealand is a brothel. This bay is cursed with drunkenness and debauchery, dreadful in the extreme. I well remember the remarks of a seaman. Says he, I am ashamed of my countrymen. It wants an earthquake or the cholera to sweep the Europeans from the earth. Kororaraka did not get cholera or an earthquake. What it did get was Honeheke. Heke was about 36 years old and a leading chief of the great Napuhi tribe. His mana increased in 1837 when he married Hariata Rongo, daughter of Honihika. Heke was one of the first to sign the Treaty of Waitangi, but he soon developed doubts. My friend, Mr. Mir, it was us who bestowed the land, yet you have invited some strange Europeans to occupy. This is not right. If the Europeans will not listen and continue to do wrong, neither will the Māoris take heed. Therefore, I will place the transgressors in a very small place indeed. Cease, therefore, to invite the European indiscriminately. 
Otherwise, I shall be very angry, very wroth indeed. Leave me a portion, a half of my kainga. Do not appropriate the whole. From me, Honeheke. The Treaty of Waitangi was signed here in February 1840. After signing, Māori expected to continue to run their own affairs with the authority of the new governor restricted to the Europeans. But the governors expected to run the whole country. Māori and Pākehā expectations of the treaty bargain soon clashed. Between 1840 and 1844, tensions mounted among the Ngāpui of the Bay of Islands. Governor Robert Fitzroy, with the help of the missionaries, tried to convince the chiefs of the government's good faith. He succeeded with some, notably Tāmati Wakanene. But Heke and his ally Kawati, a renowned 70-year-old general of the musket wars, were not persuaded. Government intervention in Māori affairs continued, and Heke did become very angry, very wroth indeed. Across the bay from Waitangi, he found the ideal means to express his anger. Heke wanted to reject Pākehā government, yet encourage civilian settlement. He needed a symbol which said no to the one, but not to the other. He found it flying here on Flagstaff Hill above Kororarika. Between July 1844 and January 1845, Hecker cut down the British flag three times. Each amputation asked this question. If the British could not protect their own flag in the midst of one of their largest settlements, what could they protect? How much substance did their claim to sovereignty over New Zealand retain? <laughs> Governor Fitzroy was determined that Heke would not cut down the flagstaff a fourth time. He sent to Australia for troops and ships. Kororarika was fortified and garrisoned, and the warship HMS Hazard lay at anchor in the bay. But early in March 1845, Heke and Kawati assembled about 450 warriors for another attack on the flagstaff. Heke's role was to take the flagstaff itself at the western end of the town, while Kawati distracted the British with a faint attack on the eastern end. Our enemy will prove very strong and brave. They will suffer much from us, and we will from them. I am not displeased, for this is war and not play. The British forces numbered 250 men on land, with cannon, blockhouses, stockades and the support of a warship. The commanders scoffed at warnings of imminent attack, saying, how will the Māori like cold steel? Neither I nor anyone else thought of Heke succeeding in an attack on our forces. On the night of 10 March, 1845, it seems Kororarika slept securely. For the British sentries on Flagstaff Hill, the night passed as normal. Except that the native owls were unusually active. The bird calls were made by Heke's men quietly working their way up the hill in small parties. As dawn broke, gunfire rang out from the other end of the town. It was Kawati and his warriors attacking the gun battle. They easily overwhelmed the small sentry detachment holding it. But it so happened that Captain David Robertson of the Hazard and 45 of his men had marched out early to work on further defences. For Kawati, this was an unfortunate accident. With other members of the Kororarika garrison, Robertson and his men rushed along this track towards the gunfire.
the parties clashed alongside Kururarika's Christchurch. Both sides fired off their guns in the half-light. Some had no time to reload, and the fighting became hand-to-hand, sword to patu. An officer advanced towards Kawati, sword in hand. The old chief called out to his men, leave him to come to me as he knelt down in the ready position. Had the soldier known how invulnerable a warrior is in this position, he would have changed his method of attack. However, the officer failed in the attempt, was thrown to the ground, and dispatched with Kawati's merry. But some duels were won by the British. Robertson himself killed or wounded three Māori before having his right thigh smashed by a musket ball. The two sides lost about 15 men each in the bitter little struggle. Robertson's party was forced to retreat, while Kawati had encountered much heavier resistance than he had expected. But the main question was, had his attack worked as a diversion? The noise of Kawati's battle with Robertson brought the Flagstaff guards out of their blockhouse to the rim of the hill, just as Napui had planned. Then Heke's party of 150 struck. Suddenly I heard an alarm, and someone called out that the natives were in the palisades. I immediately turned round and saw a number of natives rushing in and opening fire on us. Heke and his men overran the small fort and killed four of the guards. They began hacking away at the flagstaff. The staff was observed to fall, and with it, the spirits of the British force. The Hazard began bombarding what it believed to be the Māori positions. The Māori simply held their ground, keeping to cover, and both sides sniped away at each other. Captain Robertson at death's door from his thigh wound. The remaining British commanders gathered at Polak stockade to consider their next move. Pollack's house and its surrounding stockade were crammed with hundreds of civilians and fighting men. One man was smoking in the cellar where most of the ammunition was stored. At 1pm, ash from his pipe fell onto the gunpowder and the Battle of Kororarika reignited. There was more ammunition aboard the Hazard, but the British decided to abandon the town. All 500 troops, townspeople and refugees were packed into the six ships in the bay. Though Heke tried to restrain them, the temptation of an empty town full of rum was too much for his warriors. They began plundering. Heke returned some prisoners under a flag of truce, and it became clear that the Māori would not harm civilians. So missionaries and townspeople went back on shore to the Māori-held town to try to save some of their goods. Soon, anti- and pro-government Māori, as well as Pākehā townspeople, were amicably looting Kororarika together. George Selwyn, the Anglican Bishop of New Zealand, encountered a warrior who had seized a large jar of lollies. He was offered some. A Māori party allowed missionary Henry Williams to empty out one cask of rum they were taking, but were soon seen rolling out another. The strange joint sack of Kororarika went on through the night and continued next day, the 12th of March. The hazard then spoiled the party with a few volleys of cannon fire. Reminded there was a war on, the Māori set fire to the town. The remaining Pākehā fled hastily to the ships, which sailed away to Auckland. By the 13th of March, Kororarika, the liveliest red-light district in New Zealand history, had gone up in smoke. Heke's assault on British sovereignty kindled fears throughout the settlements of European New Zealand. The infant colony was shaken to its foundations. Anxiety was worst of all here in Auckland. The bustling little town of about 3,000 people genuinely feared that it was next on Honeheker's hit list. Outlying farmers were called in, volunteers were armed and drilled, night patrols were established. Some quite substantial fortifications were begun, of which this barracks wall at Auckland University survives to this day. Aucklander W.T. Bainbridge recorded mounting panic in his diary. Friday, March 21st, 1845. Many in Auckland intend to go out of the country, and some may possibly go out of their minds. As refugees continued to sail in from Kororarika, bringing increasingly lurid tales of the sack, fears in Auckland mounted to fever pitch. 
Saturday, March 22nd, a man in his eagerness to obtain passage to Sydney sold his three houses for £15. I myself bought a beautiful goat for one third of its value. This morning, the militia were called out. The settlers did hear some good news. That Hecker was about to face two enemies far more formidable than anything he had seen hitherto. One was the British Army. During the 19th century, the British Army had conquered a quarter of the entire world. In April 1845, the Empire's legions began arriving at Auckland. One regiment, the 58th, served in New Zealand until 1858. More than a thousand of its men took their discharges here and became settlers, the ancestors of many Pākehā today. The 58th had a proud reputation that drew its men from all over the British Isles, including Ireland, and re-socialised and flogged them into a new regimental community. The great advantage British soldiers had over Māori was simply that they were full-timers fighting part-timers. Warriors were also workers. Even in time of war, they had to help with planting and harvesting. The British outnumbered the Māori and their regimental spirit could equal Māori tribal spirit. The only Māori advantage seemed to be in their par fortifications. Par protected food reserves, valuable equipment and people old and young. During the tribal fighting of the 1820s and 1830s, changes were made to par to cope with the musket, but not with British artillery. The high palisades and fighting stages of traditional par made them easy game for cannon. Many pa were located on the coast, secure from tribal enemies, but vulnerable to naval bombardment. British warships and artillery spelled doom for traditional pa. Despite the fall of Kororarika, Māori seemed to have no chance in the long term against the might of the British Empire and its fighting men. Few of the British private soldiers in New Zealand left a personal account of their experience. One who did was Private Alexander Whisker of the 58th. It was the 10th of April from Sydney we set sail, and fortune did us favour with a sweet and pleasant gale. We landed in New Zealand upon that very day, and at Auckland we got orders to sail straight for the bay. Whisker and 420 of his comrades marched inland from the Bay of Islands to attack Honeheke. On the 8th of May, they arrived before his new power of Temafe at Pukatutu. At six o'clock the third of May we mustered for the war to face bold Honeyhicky, that daring Maori chief, and likewise bold Kawita that came to his relief. British drove Kawati back after fierce fighting, but just as they verged on overwhelming him, they were again attacked in the rear, this time by a sortie of Hekes men from the Pa. The British turned against the Pa a second time and were again diverted by an attack from Kawati, made at a flag signal from the Pa. Exhausted, with 50 casualties, the British had no choice but to retreat to the coast, without ever having actually assaulted Te Māwhe. Kauti on one side, Honeheke on the other, and again that baiting chamber. <laughs> it was there. Um, and never did the British enter into, into Te Māwhe uh, Pa. Uh, they couldn't get in there. Uh, it was well and truly set with uh, deliberate planning so that it could wait, bait, inflict uh, whatever and then of course the ultimate was the British, British finally withdrew. Heke and Kawati had dealt with the British like two matadors managing a bull, each relieving the pressure on the other. This was brilliant improvisation 
not a lasting antidote to British military advantages. But what the battle did do was prove that Māori could cope with the culture shock of awesome new military technology. At Pukatutu, the British used the Congreve rocket for the first time. Warriors thought the fearsome missile would chase the people until it had killed them every one. One man fled to Kawati with stories of the frightful rocket gun. Kawati was unimpressed. I know all about all sorts of guns. All guns will kill and all guns will also miss. This is the nature of guns. But if you say one more word, I'll split your head with my tomahawk. Kawati was an old man. He'd been born into a Māori world which did not know metal, let alone Congreve rockets. No tribal enemy had ever threatened him with rockets or mortars or heavy cannon. Yet he refused to be intimidated by the new technology. For the moment, the Battle of Pukatutu meant that Heke and Kawati had seen off the first of their two enemies, the British Army. They now had to face the second, their own Napui kin. Heke was closely related to the people of the Hokianga, but some of his Hokianga kin believed his actions would end the valuable European trade. They decided to oppose him. They were led by a war leader whose mana matched that of Heke and Kawati, Tamati Wakanene. Soon after the fall of Kororaraka, Wakanene arrived at the Bay of Islands with 300 warriors. He came not only as an ally of the British, but also for his own reasons. He demanded that Heke cease fighting. When Heke refused, the two factions clashed in a series of skirmishes. At first, the Kin War was fought with gloves on. Prisoners were returned and the two sides met in the evening to compare notes on the day's fighting. But as crops burned, men died and insults flew, the conflict intensified. In early June, Wakanene and his ally Te Taunui seized Heke's old pa of Te Ahua. Heke was very much enraged to see his fort snatched from him, and he determined to retake it before the soldiers should return from Auckland to help Waka. So he sent messengers to all parts for reinforcements. Heke marched to retake Te Ahua. Waka came out to meet him, and a fierce tribal battle resulted. So now Waka charged Heke, and Heke fired like thunder against Waka. Tākere had both his eyes shot out, but we held our fire until we were close up to Heke's people. We did not miss them. We had revenge for our friends who had fallen. We pressed Heke hard. Not one of us remembered the light of this world, nor thought of life. The struggle swayed to and fro until Heke heard that his old friend Takahakaha had fallen. When he went to rescue him, his war priest called after him that he had breached Tapu and lost the favour of the gods. Heke roared out his reply. What care I for either men or spirits? I fear not. Let the fellow in heaven look to it. Have I not prayed to him for years? I will carry off the old man alone. Heke was shot trying to save Takahaka. He was carried to safety by a few loyal followers. Most of his men fled. The immediate result of the Battle of Te Ahuahu was disaster for Heke. He lost a number of warriors, several important allies, and he himself was badly wounded. There were no British troops involved in the battle, and it therefore disappeared from the history books. But at the time, the British were well aware that Māori resistance was on the ropes. Heke was knocked out of the war for six months. Only Kawati remained, with a mere 100 warriors, at the pa he was building near Nafa. A big new British expedition massed, and in late June 1845, it moved in for the kill. This little Northland Valley is an important place in world military history. It was here that modern trench warfare was invented. The churchyard marks the site of Ohiowai, the pa designed by Kawati in 1845. His hundred or so warriors range from 70-year-old Kawati himself to renowned young toa like Ruatara Tauramoko and 12-year-old boy warriors like Rihara Kou. 
They were outnumbered by more than six to one when the British finally attacked on the 1st of July, 1845. <laughs> Missionary Robert Burroughs had been allowed to visit Ohio during the early stages of construction. This stone wall around the church marks the line of the Palisades. But as the Palisades rose, Burroughs found himself banned from the park. Building operations of late have been carried on with remarkable caution and secrecy for natives, and it is not easy to ascertain their strength. Kauti knew that Burroughs reported what he saw to the British commanders. He did not want the missionary to spoil the surprise he had in store. But it, uh, what sort of is curious for me is that uh, even Wakanene didn't know and his men didn't know uh, what was going on. By the 23rd of June, the British Expeditionary Force was encamped before Ohawai under its new commander, Colonel Henry Despard. He had 630 British troops, as well as 250 Napuhi under Wakanene. The British wanted to crush Kawati quickly, while Heke was out of action. To Despard, the pass seemed to have one major weakness. It was surrounded by hills from which cannon could fire into it. Despard established his batteries on their slopes and began bombarding the pass, firing six 12 and 32 pound round shot and shell from his guns. The British kept up their bombardment for a week. They moved their fortified batteries closer and closer until their shots could not miss. Major Cyprian Bridge, the commander of the 58th Regiment, recorded the bombardment in his diary. 24 June, shell, ball and grape into the par all day. Twenty-eight June. Our guns did good execution. Nearly every shot told. There appears to be a good deal of damage done to it. Twenty-nine June. By about 2 p.m., 100 shots and shells were fired into the par from the hill, which must have astonished the weak minds of the natives. On the 1st of July, expecting to find the garrison utterly pulverized by the cannonade, Despard sent 250 hand-picked men to storm Ohio. The survivors would remember it for the rest of their lives. We got the orders. Charge! When we were within about 50 paces of the stockade, we cheered and went at it with a rush. We were then met with such a fusillade that I can only describe it as the opening of the doors of a monster furnace. The party was literally mown down. I thought it would be all right, but when I got up close and saw the strength of the fence, my heart sank within me. The bugle sounded the retreat. We retired. The whole area was strewn with wounded and dead, a very frightful sight. The engagement lasted about ten minutes, with the loss of half of the men. It was a heartrending sight to see the number of gallant fellows left dead on the field and to hear the groans and cries of the wounded for us not to leave them behind. The British lost 114 men killed and wounded at Ohawa. To Europeans in both Britain and New Zealand, the defeat at Ohawai seemed unbelievable. How could Imperial British troops, equipped with the latest in heavy artillery, have been beaten by less than a sixth their number of so-called savages? How could the impossible have taken place? The answer was a Maori revolution in the art of war. Ohawai had two fences and a firing trench right around it. Warriors reloaded while standing safely in the bottom of the trench, then stepped up to fire through the gap in the fences. Fence and trench were protection from the guns and bayonets of a storming party. The trenches were laid out unevenly to bring attackers under fire from two directions at once. The outermost fence, the Pekarangi, was not intended to block a storming party, but to slow them up to be shot. It could be pulled down or clambered over, 
but it took time, which the defenders used to shoot, reload and shoot again. Basically, the Pekarangi had the same function as barbed wire on more recent battlefields. The whole front of the pa flashed fire. Guns flashed from the foot of the stockade and from loopholes higher up. Small calf hiding the pa from us. Yells and cheers and men falling all around. Not a single Maori could we see. They were all safely hidden. What could we do? Covered passages into the interior of the pa meant that Kawati could quickly and safely concentrate his few men at threatened points, in effect multiplying their numbers. But he knew he could only do this if they survived the initial bombardment. So he pocked the inside of Ohawai with deep pits and underground caverns, probably the world's first anti-artillery bunkers. These bunkers blunted the bombardment. The trenches blunted the assault. Kawiti never gave up his desire to see how good uh, these professional soldiers were. I think he began to see that in open warfare that uh, the British were far superior. And so when it came to garrison warfare, if you like, uh, he wanted to see what kind of reaction would happen there. And uh, he was able to prove then that this battle, as far as garrison warfare was concerned, was far superior. And similarly to Kororaraka, they waited, they set the bait, they snared into a killing zone, they hit, and like silky smoothness, slid out from under. The victorious Māori abandoned Ohawai a few days after the assault. It had served its purpose. Despard occupied the empty par and he and Fitzroy tried to claim this as some kind of victory. Nobody believed them. Indeed, they did not even believe themselves, and their real attitude is revealed by their attempt to negotiate a peace, something which would have been absolutely unthinkable before Ohawai. In effect, the Battle of Ohawai suspended military operations for no less than five months, a welcome respite for the wounded Heke and his part-time Māori warriors. Ohawai was a great Māori victory, one that was celebrated in haka and song. Fight! Fight! You will not return to your village to Europe because of the driving force of the warriors. Oh, Jesus Christ and the book, I will turn my back and empty my bowels upon them. Exactly 27 years after the battle, uh, the local chief, Heta Tahara, asked the government if the bones of the soldiers who had fallen at that battle be buried in consecrated ground in this um, cemetery. And the fact that these men who came from so far away are now lying with some of the people they actually fought with. Upon that day, I'm grieved to say, three officers were slain, and many a gallant soldier lay dead upon the plain. We buried them in two days' time, which grieved our hearts full sore, to see so many heroes all buried in their gore. We had no coffins made for them, but all was silent round. We rolled them in their blankets and gently laid them down. Five months after Ohawai, a new governor arrived to replace Robert Fitzroy. The British base camp on the Bay of Islands coast rang with artillery salutes, regimental bands and Māori haka to mark the arrival of George Grey. 34-year-old Grey was a trained soldier, a strange mix of humanity and ruthlessness. He was one of the most able colonial governors of Britain's imperial history. Like Honeheke, George Grey was a man of many thoughts. The shock defeat at Ohawai had prompted peace feelers by Governor Fitzroy. Heke and Kawati were willing. Heke was recovering from his wounds and both were finding that war with the British was expensive. Grey pretended to pursue peace while hardening the terms and tightening the deadlines. This provoked fresh defiance from Heke. My friend, the new governor, we are strangers. God made this country for us. It cannot be sliced. If it were a whale, it might be sliced. 
Do you return to your own country, to England, which was made by God for you? God has made this land for us, and not for any stranger to meddle with. Gray believed he could succeed where Fitzroy had failed. On the 7th of December, 1845, the third and largest British expeditionary force set out to crush Māori resistance. Napuhi had put the British Empire to a lot of trouble. No less than 1,700 men marched to attack Kawati at his new pa. The advance was a nightmare for the British troops, dragging cannon and supplies through dense bush, cutting their road as they went. The painful rate of advance was one mile a day, and when they arrived on the day before Christmas, this is what they found. Ruapekapeka, the bat's nest, a new Kawati masterpiece. Today, this is all that remains of Ruapekapeka. The palisades are long gone, and the moon-like surface of trenches and bunkers are the only reminders of the sophistication of Kawati's military architecture. For 18 days, the British and their Māori allies built protective stockades, batteries and encampments. They skirmished with raiders from the pa, and then they pounded it with the biggest artillery bombardment of the war. 26th. The great guns and rockets was kept going on the par every hour through the day. We had to go on picket after a march without a night in bed. 31st, 10 o'clock a.m. One of the volunteers went down to wash some clothes and Coeta's men come on him and shot him. There was five balls in him. Me and me comrades had our New Year breakfast of peppermint tea and damp. Colonel Despard would not let any more guns than one be fired at a time. He had to hold his head when they would fire like a piece of patchwork for fear of it tearing. 3rd of January. Last night we all lay down and kept ourselves as quiet as possible. And we heard those in the park talking. The chiefs were exhorting them to be strong, to be firm and brave, and they would serve out the Pakeha as they had done at Ohaiwai. We threw in some shell and rockets as the garrison at the par were taking their breakfast. One shell caught a woman through the waist, caught a child's head off and killed a chief. I fancy they're leaving the par by parties and that they'll all shortly bolt. But I hope not before our batteries open fully on them, as it's better that we should drive them out than they should go of their own accord, just to show them what we can do and to take the conceit out of the rascals. On the morning of the 11th of January, some of Wakanene's warriors began to suspect that the bird had flown. They and the British charged into the par and found it almost empty. There was a long and confused fight on the further side of the par, but in the end the British and their allies held Ruapekapeka. What had happened? The traditional story is that the British seized the almost empty par while the garrison were outside. Accounts vary as to why they were outside. Did they go out to avoid the British shells? Did they go out simply to have breakfast? Did they go out for Sunday prayers? But most accounts agree that the Māori then tried to retake the pa and were bloodily repulsed by the British, who thus gained the decisive victory that won them the whole Northern War. But there is mystery about the Battle of Ruapekapeka. The Māori knew that the British would not respect the Sabbath. Ohaiwai had already been bombarded on a Sunday, and they had no need to leave the par to avoid the bombardment. We were safe below in our bunkers when the big guns poured shot and shell into us. Therefore, why should we fear the cannon of the white troops? Despite the British siege lines, Ngāpuhi could get in and out of Ruapekapeka at will. They were not merely leaving to avoid the bombardment, but deliberately removing their ammunition and supplies. All this suggests that the abandonment of the path was planned. The guns and rockets kept firing on, and the people in Rua Pika Pika began to get quite tired of hearing the shells bursting all around them continually. Heke, now recovered from his wound, had arrived in the pa on the 9th of January. You are foolish to remain in this pa to be pounded by cannonballs. Let us leave it, let the soldiers have it, and we will retire into the forest and draw them after us, where they cannot bring the big guns. So all the people left the park except Kawati, who remained with a few warriors, either because he was determined to fire some shots in the defence of his pa, or to make the trap more convincing, or both. Kawati directed Tauramoko to feign a retreat with a party of men to draw the British troops into the bush, where other warriors lay in ambush. 
but some men thought Kawati had been captured and would not retreat. The planned trap misfired, and in the end casualties were roughly equal. But the British had gone to immense effort to drag themselves up to Ruapekapeka and then gained an empty par. What was it worth to them? Not much. Unlike traditional par, it was not built close to centres of population. It did not contain vital food reserves or equipment. It was not Kawati's home, but a purpose-built target for the British to come to and be killed. The British paid a very high price for what was basically a valueless par. They did not capture Heke, they did not capture Kawati, they did not kill many of their people. At best, Rua Peka Peka was a small tactical victory and a big strategic defeat. The key question is, if the British did not win what history has portrayed as the decisive battle of the Northern War, can they still be said to have won the war? Heke and Kawati made peace after Rua Peka Peka. First with Wakanene, then with George Grey. But it was not a piece of the defeated. Missionary Henry Williams wrote, It cannot be said we have peace of a healthy character. Heke is exciting much sympathy. He is at large, and his cause is by no means extinguished. The Māori lost no land. They were not punished in any way. There was no attempt by the government to assert authority over them, and the flagstaff at Kororarika was not re-erected until after the deaths of Heke and Kawati. They believed in what they were doing, they were positive, you know, and the typical Ngāpuhi haka reflects that. Kaeke te wiwi, kaeke te wawa, kaeke te papara huairangi. Nothing was impossible. That was their character. Uh, there was nothing too high, too rich, too deep, too dig, too broad, or even too far. Um, the belief was such that nothing was impossible. This was the first full war between British and Māori, and despite the odds in their favour, the British did not win it. Their victory came in the history books, won by the pen when the sword had failed. Failure was an extremely unusual event in the history of British expansion. The British army fought a lot of wars in the 19th century, and they did not lose many of them. British defeat in the Northern War was not the result of their own blunders, nor of high Māori numbers, but of the Māori invention of trench warfare. Both British and Māori made models of Kawati's revolutionary new power. The British model went north, but languished in a museum, and its lessons were forgotten. The Māori model went south to other tribes. Among them, its lessons were learned. <laughs> 